Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison. I want to welcome you to this session of Humanity Rising as we embark on day two of a five-day program on technologies of hope. I'd like to start this morning with a very brief uh, reflection of why it is that technology has been so problematic for the human race particularly since the Industrial Revolution and why the use of technology uh, has brought us quite literally uh, to the brink of extinction along with a million other species as we all teeter on the brink of the precipice with climate change and a variety of other challenges uh, induced by our use of technology uh, in the world today. It's a very complex subject. Uh, but I want to uh, uh, reflect in the following way. Technology really began uh, with the Greeks in a fundamental way. It was Pythagoras the, in the 6th century BC Greek philosopher who was the first one that we know of to discern that nature as we experience nature, was governed by laws that were discernible by the human mind. Before Pythagoras, no one that we know of had understood that the natural environment, the ecological framework within which we live is actually discernible. And that opened up uh, for the human race some possibilities that had really never been conceived before. That if nature is knowable, nature is manipulatable. And this is a very important fact for us to be aware of as we contemplate what technology is uh, and how we use it. The Greek word for nature was phusis. And that essentially means is the process by which things arise and die. Because everything in nature is in constant flux and is arising and falling away. But when you take in that embedded in nature are mathematical principles, geometric shapes. For the first time, it's possible to go into nature, discern the mathematics, and develop what the Greeks called mechanics, technology. But the essence of what mechanics means in the Greek is to trick. And I want us to just think about it for a moment. Nature's in perpetual flux. And what humans seek to do, unique among species worldwide in its power, is to bring stability and fixity to that which is always moving. We're all in houses. Most of us have central heating. We drive in cars. If you think about it, most of what we do as human beings is to protect ourselves from the ebbs and flows of nature. We don't like to be outside in the winter. We like to be inside. So the natural impulse of humans in civilization, as Sigmund Freud says, is to give humanity a capacity to dominate nature. Because even though we're of nature, we want to control nature so that it's comfortable for us. And that's why, said the Greeks, we use trickery. We use mechanics. And so if you think about the history of technology, it's the history of how human beings in an ever-changing world are trying to fashion stability through accessing the mathematics 
inherent in nature, which is what Pythagoras discerned, to create a world that we control. But the world that we control is inherently in contradiction with nature. And that's why there's always instability. If everything is in flux and there's a species seeking stability and control and dominance, there's an inherently contradictory, conflictual dynamic between the very technologies and the very mechanics that we employ to make an unstable natural order conformative to human issues and human drives and the most basic human uh, uh, agenda around stability. So there's much that can be said about it, but the bottom line is that the use of technology as we've experienced always leads to a dominance that even though we're using technology for the best of our motives, we just wanna be comfortable. So we invent all these products and all these technologies but in the existential reality within which we find ourselves, we end up where we are. And I know this begs this question about whether there's good technology and bad technology, and there for sure is, and we're spending this week on the technologies of hope. But I want to raise this question that is very deep. Uh, in any discussion about the application of technology uh, and whether uh, technology itself uh, is something that is problematic uh, in its essence. Uh, over the next couple of days, I'll uh, be reflecting on what the Greeks and other uh, Jewish and Hindu thinkers have thought about this, but I'll leave it for now. And before we dive into our program, I want to uh, invite all of us to just pause in the midst of all the tumult and the hustle and the bustle uh, to simply breathe together. In a world of escalating turbulence, developing inner coherence is a fundamental imperative and the most effective and fast way to do it is simply to breathe. So I want to invite you to breathe now uh, with me. You'll hear the sound of a bell. When you hear the first bell, just start to breathe in for about five and a half seconds. You'll hear another bell and just exhale for about five and a half seconds. We'll take 10 breaths together. When you breathe this way, you breathe in five and a half breaths in a minute. You take in five and a half liters of air. And it is the most effective way to calm your body, optimize your body systems, bring coherence between your heart and your brain, and instill you with the emotional calm and mental acuity that all of us need for a world of complexity. Thank you, everyone. Let us breathe together. Georg. Thank you. 
Thank you, everyone. You know, one of the ancient Greek thinkers defined phusis, the Greek word for nature, as that breath that unites all the contraries into harmony. And just like when you breathe coherently, you unite all of what you are into a unity. Reflect for a moment that that's nature at its best. It's in this spirit that I want to welcome my good friends, George Caponelli, the founder and CEO of Age Nation, and Tom Eddington, the founder and CEO of Endangered Global. Tom and uh, George and I have been like the three musketeers uh, developing Humanity Rising, uh, and as George mentioned yesterday, into Humanity Rising Network uh, next year. They've convened many of our programs and now the uh, Technologies of Hope. So George and Tom, I turn the program over to you. Thanks, Jim. Thanks very much. Welcome, everybody, to day two of <clears throat> Technologies of Hope. When I think back to the fact that uh, Homo sapiens have been, uh, it's been said that Homo sapiens emerged on the plains of Africa about 250,000 years ago, appreciably before the Greeks, of course. Uh, and for a very long time, throughout the history of this species, uh, innovation and invention have been part of the history of the world. In many ways, for a long time, that innovation and uh, experimentation was done with uh, an inherent, if not a logical or mental sense of the mathematics of the world. There was great harmony because people lived in reliance on and in support of the natural laws for a long time. And it was only, as Jim reported, in some ways, with the Industrial Revolution, that humanity took a detour and this obsessive concern about power over nature played a more significant role. And with that, we lost touch with those inherent laws of nature and alignment with the mystery that allowed humanity to survive for so many of those 250,000 years. Now, however, I think at this time of crisis in our world, at this time when we are on the lip of potential extinction, what we're seeing emerging are a variety of people who through their intelligence and their discipline and their imagination are finding ways to help mitigate the damage that has been created largely since the 1700s. And so now we're birthing this thing called the technologies of hope, because I do believe that if we as human beings learn to use the technologies that emerge, the mechanics, as Jim calls them, for the greater good and with genuine consciousness, remarkable changes can still be made that might allow us to protect humanity, the other species, and the well-being of the planet. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Tom, do you have some opening thoughts you'd like to share? Yeah, thanks, George, and uh, and thanks, Jim. Just a, a couple of things I'll I'll share. So, Jim, your your comments about humanity using technology to control nature, certainly in contemporary society, we've we've taken it a step further, uh, as George was saying, and we've tried to control each other for good and for ill. And we've also tried to, to control the human body, both for good and ill. And certainly today's program is going to be in part about how we were using technology for, uh, for the benefit of, of the human body. Um, the other piece I'll, I'll share is if, if we look across societies throughout human history, and I'll, I'll, I'll use Chaco Canyon in particular, the Chacoan people at some point in their efforts to, to control nature uh, realized that they had gone too far. And at some point, they sealed up all of the buildings, and you know, the archaeologists and anthropologists still don't know uh, where the buildings seized to keep something in or to keep something out. But they abandoned the uh, uh, Chaco Canyon and the other Chacoan uh, sites uh, across the 75,000 acre or 75,000 thousand mile uh, area here in the in the southwest 
And we've got other, other uh, whether it's Easter Island or other locations around the world where human populations at some point realized that the technology they were using to control nature and each other wasn't working. And I'll, I'll leave it there and look forward to our, our panel today. Thanks, Tom. So let me uh, introduce David Schmidt. David, will you turn on your camera and come on on, please? David's the CEO uh, and founder of LifeWave, a leading wellness company. He's also a longtime inventor. I understand 94 issued patents, 13 pending, and 70 of those are in the field of regenerative science and technology. And among these is something called uh, a, a patent uh, that deals with the double helix conductor. David's going to tell us more about that. It produces fields made up of electromagnetic and non-electromagnetic energy. And these fields do a number of different things we're going to talk about today, including improve wound recovery, and it can produce results and benefits that are comparable and in some ways uh, different than traditional stem cell treatments. David's also under an organization called Advanced Applications Group, has done a lot of research and development on a whole host of things. We're going to ask him to tell us a little bit about some of those remarkable things that involve bladeless turbine generators and combustion rocket engines and new methods for producing oxygen and hydrogen. Our central focus is going to be on wellness. David, welcome. It's a, a delight to have you with us today. Uh, thank you, George. Really enjoy being here today. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak to your community. And also, uh, I really enjoyed the opening because I would be an inventor that adopts the philosophy of researching and developing biomimetic technologies, those technologies which mimic life. And this is an extraordinarily exciting area of research and technology because it means what we're intentionally trying to do is create things which work in harmony with nature. Uh, so we will have a planet and technologies that are sustainable. So uh, you're, for me, you're hitting all the right buttons today. So tell us, um, since one of the, the emergences from this double helix uh, discovery is this patch this product called LifeWave. Talk to us about LifeWave. What, what is it? What does it do, do? Why did you create it? You know, that sort of stuff. Sure. <laughs> so, well, uh, in the 90s, I had a, a very small company with a group of guys uh, called Advanced Applications Group, and we were developing new technologies, uh, survival equipment for the U.S. Navy through government contractors. So we were an independent workshop, and uh, the things that we were focusing on were power generation systems, emergency oxygen supplies, new types of batteries and fuel cells. I happened to uh, make a presentation on one of these systems that I came up with, and uh, as a result, I was invited to be part of a design team for one of the Navy's uh, next generation mini subs. And the objective was to find a way to keep people alive longer. And up to that point, what personnel were doing were using things like caffeine and amphetamines to stay awake for a long period of time. So you have the SEALs could go on missions that were 30 hours, 60 hours, and uh, they need to be able to perform. So I thought, okay, this is going to be this is a cutting edge technology, this sub. So maybe we can do something cutting edge with survivability. So I began to look at um, ways that we could improve the way energy is made and utilized in the human body. And what this led to was a way to stimulate the body with low levels of light in a completely new way that had never been done before to turn on a biological process. It's called beta oxidation, uh, but the public knows it is fat burning. Uh, so a new way to turn on fat burning to increase energy and uh, it turned out that it worked really well. Uh, within about 20 minutes of application, uh, people would get 20, 30% or more energy 
and the energy was very constant and stable throughout the day. And then over a period of the last 20 years, this has been uh, developed. We have over 80 clinical studies. We're doing some very advanced things now that I wasn't even dreaming about 20 years ago. And from this life wave as we know it, the, 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 those patches, tell us about the patches. What? Yeah, so the patches are, they're small devices that you apply to the body, but there is no chemical that's in the patch that goes into the body. Instead, it uses your body as a power source. So it takes body heat and it activates uh, these organic crystals that are in the patch and the crystals start to reflect very specific wavelengths of light at very low levels that stimulate the surface of the skin. So this is a process called photobiomodulation, but it just simply means that we can turn on a biochemical process in the cell using low levels of light. And uh, there are over 5,000 clinical studies now in the uh, public domain of how this process works. But it basically, you stimulate the skin, it's going to turn on in the electron transport chain, cytochrome C oxidase, Cytochrome C oxidase uh, then increases ATP production in the mitochondria. And now we have a, a reserve of energy where we can turn on uh, receptors or we can turn on genes that will allow for an increase in, let's say, a specific peptide that's going to mobilize stem cells or detoxify the body through increasing antioxidant production. And what about the, the, the statement I made earlier that I read in your material as well about wound healing? Yeah. Um, so I started this work back around 2008, 2009. And at the time, we were interested in stem cell research and looking at what type of device could activate the stem cells already in the body. So we know that stem cell medicine is the future. 10 or 20 years from now, people will go into a clinic and a hospital and they'll be given an injection of stem cells. This is gonna be wonderful because stem cells are how uh, our bodies heal, right? They're, they're going to produce collagen growth factors. So this is in complete harmony with the human body. Uh, but now today, stem cell therapy is not widely available. Uh, there's a lot of regulatory challenges and still there's some scientific hurdles to overcome. So what I was looking at, you know, more than 10 years ago now was, was there a way we could take the stem cells that are already in our body and reset them to a younger state and make them more active? We put in years of research to developing something called a double helix conductor. I actually brought one out of my lab to, to show your folks here today. Uh, but this is an electromagnetic coil. Uh, we ha it produces a blend of electromagnetic and non-electromagnetic waves, produce a longitudinal field. And it very much resembles a uh, toroidal uh, wrap of DNA. And so what we found that we could do with this is dramatically accelerate wound healing. So uh, we worked with a number of researchers, including Dr. Norm Sheely, and we ended up uh, doing two investigational studies after we got through our animal testing, uh, which was showing that it was safe and very effective. We chose two different populations, one with idiopathic uh, neuropathy and the other with diabetic neuropathy. And of course, in those pathologies, we're going to see elevated levels at least in diabetic neuropathy, we're going to see elevated levels of blood sugar that damage peripheral nerves, uh, primarily in the feet. And what we found that we could do with this technology is induce a signal that would trigger neurogenesis and neurite outgrowth. So we were finding that uh, we could regrow uh, the peripheral nerves and do it safely. That required one treatment per week, which was 30 minutes. And, uh, the treatments ran over a period of eight weeks. So in the first week, uh, we had 68% of the population saw significant improvements in their condition. 
after week number two, it was 86%. And after three weeks of treatment, uh, only three treatments, uh, it was 100% of the population were, were seeing benefits. So by the end of the eight weeks, uh, what we had done was reduce pain levels, improve circulation, reversed the pathology. So it was a very, very exciting start to this program. And so, Tom, jump in and, you know, with questions that you have. Yeah, I was, I was about to do that. So I, I've been following the, uh, the stem cell research over the last 20 years. And, you know, when I, when I look at how stem cell research has, has taken place, and some of the applications in the early days, it was taking stem cells out from some someplace outside the, the individual, injecting them into the body, oftentimes at the site uh, where they were, they were needed. And then, uh, the, you know, the, the evolution of that technology has been taking the, the stem cells from a person's blood and then injecting them back into the body. And what's fascinating for me is your, your technology and how you're through a, an external patch with no intervention into the, the body itself, uh, you're able to not only activate the stem cells, but enable the body to send them to where, where they need to be, which is just, it's an extraordinary evolution over the last 20 years. Yeah, it, it well, it's a really interesting point that you're raising. So let's say that we uh, look at the case where we want to do stem cell therapy safely. So some of, as you mentioned, some of the alternatives that are available is to give someone a drug which will induce the stem cells in the bone marrow to come out into the blood. You then capture the blood, filter it, and extract the stem cells and can either use them or you can inject them. And then of course, stem cells we're gonna find in, in body fat as well. So those are two possible extraction mechanisms. But the uh, disadvantage to that approach is that as people age, the quality and the number of the stem cells begin to decline. So we see that after age 60, uh, there's a 60 to 80% decrease in stem cell activity. What we began to look at was, what can we do to remedy this? So I had found some work in the literature uh, by Dr. Lauren Picard. In biology, of course, what we had always learned was that aging was a one-way street and that, uh, you know, you're born, you age, and then you die, and there's basically, you know, nothing you can do about that. There's a phenomena called uh, parabiosis, and basically you take the blood of, you know, a young mammal, and you, you put it, that, that blood in an old mammal, and the old mammal starts to become young again. And uh, interestingly, the FDA has more or less banned, uh, you know, this practice. But what Dr. Picard had done 50 years ago was to take liver cells uh, from someone that was 80 and incubate them in the blood of someone that was in their 20s, and the liver cells started to regenerate and become young and healthy. And over a period of a number of years, he isolated that to uh, principally copper peptide although there, there are a few other peptides that do show some pretty significant age reversal effects. But he found that uh, copper peptide, GHKCU, was this master regulator of uh, gene expression in the body as well as stem cell activity. So he began to run a number of studies and publish them showing that uh, copper peptide could induce some very significant stem cell activity in the body. Uh, the problem is that you can't take this peptide orally uh, because it breaks down in the stomach and is slightly toxic. And most people don't wanna give themselves injections of copper peptide on a, uh, on a daily basis. I saw this research and I thought, okay, this is very much in line with the work we're doing with the double helix conductor. Let's see if we can now develop a uh, light therapy device that will mobilize the stem cells and use uh, wavelengths of light instead of using these uh, lower frequency, what we're producing in the, in the double helix conductor. And so we were uh, successful at this and now have a patch that stimulates the skin with light. When you draw the blood within 24 hours, you see statistically significant increases in copper peptide. And within about the first week, 
uh, you see statistically significant improvements in protein synthesis, in metabolism, and uh, where we started in wound healing. So basically you put this patch on, it elevates a uh, peptide in the body, which naturally declines with age. This resets the stem cells to a more youthful state, and it will activate the P63 gene, which gets the stem cells to go to where they're needed. So that's under the hood about how that works. And is it is it actually recruiting the, uh, the stem cells out of the bone marrow? No, actually, it, it does something a bit different. Uh, copper peptide acts as a Yamanaka factor. So not only do we see the stem cell, the circulating stem cells get reset to a more youthful state, but the, the uh, skin stem cells, they actually revert to pluripotent stem cells that now increase the number of circulating stem cells. So we have, I have some uh, pictures that I can show later of uh, how in real life, this has an impact on wound healing and overall health. But yeah, so what, what we see so far, we haven't shown whether or not there's any stem cells in the bone marrow, but for sure, uh, there are stem cells in the skin that revert to being pluripotent that now increase the number of circulating stem cells. I have to tell you a very a quick personal story. Um, I was introduced to the patch several years ago. Not very long after that, I was out for a hike in a box canyon, and I was hiking with just hiking sandals. And I took a misstep, and I slammed my other foot into a rock, so much so that I had to break a branch off of a tree as a staff to work my way out of the, the canyon. And we were supposed to go on a major 10-mile hike two days later. And I said to Sadina, my wife, no way in hell am I going to be able to go. Um, so she suggested that I put a couple of patches on the bottom of my foot and my big toe. And I left it on for 12 hours, and then I put another patch on and so forth. Within two days, I was in a hiking boot. Uh, on a 10 mile hike with no after effects. And to this day, it still amazes me, you know? <laughs> and somebody, awesome. somebody in the chat, Kurt in the chat was saying, uh, how does this impact neuropathy? Uh, and I would imagine based on what you described as uh, it, the treatment uh, that it can have significant impact. Yeah, what we found, so first neuropathy, uh, whether or not it's induced by high blood sugar levels or whether or not it's idiopathic. Um, we do know that uh, when we see nerve damage in the body, it's as a result of a decline in the master antioxidant glutathione. Uh, I had the pleasure to work with uh, Dr. Tom Budzinski many years ago, and that was uh, his life work was looking for a treatment for Parkinson's disease. Today, as a result, uh, many medical doctors will give their patients IVs of glutathione to help uh, move sugar out of the body, manage blood sugar levels, as well as protect the nerves. So the first thing is that if someone has neuropathy, they should be taking a supplement such as NAC, getting enough cysteine in their diet. They can use a technology like our patches to help protect the nerves. Uh, there's actually uh, literature which shows that uh, copper peptide does in fact uh, induce neurite outgrowth and neurogenesis and can be used as a method for managing neuropathy. That's obviously a medical claim and we don't make that claim about our product because we haven't done that clinical study. But with the double helix conductor, we have done those studies and we did in fact show that it will regenerate nerves. So the good news is that if someone is suffering from uh, neuropathy, uh, that there is technology uh, both here now and on the horizon to very successfully manage and reverse that condition. I'm interested in hearing about the, the longevity pieces you were just talking about. So maybe we can pick up there. Sure. You know, I actually saw in the chat, uh, there's a number of people that are concerned about having 8 billion people on the planet in a living 900 years. <laughs> and uh, as a practical matter, I don't really see that happening for a number of reasons. And I, I would be in agreement that 
I don't think having 8 billion people on the planet is a good idea either. The trend currently is depopulation and uh, depopulation actually very, very rapidly. At least those are the projections that I've seen. As to what number of people the planet can support, I'll leave that to other scientists and politicians. Maybe we can do that with policy. The goal that everyone has is sustainability and to live on a planet that is clean and uh, and healthy. So you know, from my perspective, the technology that we're developing, uh, healing the body and supporting the body with light, I hope will create a shift in consciousness and the way people think about things that we don't have to uh, resolve all of our health problems with pharmaceuticals, which are synthetic molecules to begin with, and by definition are not in harmony with nature, that we can, we can do things in harmony with nature that are good for our health and produce some dramatic results. And maybe this shift in consciousness will help people think about energy producing technologies, transportation, uh, material science in completely different ways as well. So in the last piece, uh, in, in answer to Tom's question, you made some comment about uh, sprays. Would you talk about how, how does this technology work or how does the technology translate into not just the patches, uh, but to other things? So this is a different technology that I've developed, and it uses a um, structured water that I invented. So to describe this, I have uh, a number of patents that I've filed on this, so I can talk about it a little bit. So I'm going to show you this coin, which looks like gold, but it actually isn't. This is a new material that never existed before. It doesn't exist outside of our labs. So we were using this double helix conductor and we were using it to accelerate protein synthesis in the cell in the endoplasmic reticulum and what we were finding is that the rate of tissue repair was exceeding the biological limits of tissue repair so i began to think that there was something else going on so uh myself and another researcher we got came up with this concept and we began to grow crystals in our lab and we were finding that this technology could in fact make crystals grow faster and also they would bring the crystals into alignment so i used to develop metal alloys back in the day and so i thought let's run a very very basic experiment we're going to take a element that is a low melting point and in this case this is uh, made of tin and uh, what we'll do is we'll produce a pacification layer by letting it combine with ambient oxygen. And normally tin will, when it oxidizes, will become kind of like a dull gray. And what we saw is that when we subjected the metal to the energy coming out of the coil, that the energy, that this changed the bond angle, the way oxygen was attaching to the metal and it was increasing the amount of energy in the reaction. There's a lot more to it. But the, the simple explanation is we sent this out. We used a piece of equipment called X-ray diffraction. And we were able to validate that this material never existed before. So then I began to think that, okay, hydro, how are we going to apply this so that it can benefit people? Hydrogen exists in a metallic state. So what if we broke down hydrogen into a metallic state, subjected the hydrogen to the energy of this coil along with oxygen, and maybe what we could do is create a new phase of water. And we, in fact, were successful with this. We were producing water structures that we had never seen before. So I took this technology, and then for the first product, what we did was uh, took the water as a base and we added specific herbs and essential oils to it. Uh, so the water acts as a delivery system. And what we found is that the nutrients in the water could be absorbed by the body very quickly. They could be metabolized very quickly. 
and we could do some really interesting things. So I'm 59, and uh, one of the things I'm interested in is keeping my testosterone levels and other hormones elevated as I age. What we showed in our blood studies is that within the first three days, there were people that could double and even triple their testosterone levels. So my testosterone levels today went from the mid 300s to over 700. 700 nanograms, that's gonna be about a man in his early 30s. So these sprays are for improving hormone profile, improving energy, and uh, one product specifically improves sleep. So uh, <laughs> sign me up considering I'm significantly older than 59, you know? What, what are some of the other things? Um, uh, in a little bit, I wanna weave back to Jim's opening about technology and uh, you know, the, the technology, the consciousness of humanity and the, the, perhaps some of the natural impediments. You, you've done so many other things, David, you know? You've talked about this drone that you've created and and other things. Talk a little bit about the, the other mechanics. Uh, yeah, so the drone. So actually, uh, where this started was with my son. And I was just looking to do a father-son project with him. And as we got to talking about what, what we could do, I began to think back on some of the technology uh, that I worked on in the 90s. And I thought, okay, maybe with a little bit of updating, we could develop a drone technology that had never been available before. And, you know, what's the mission statement? What do we want to try to accomplish? And it became kind of self-evident from the very beginning that this was going to be something really extraordinary. So at this point in time, after about two years of development, we're at the place now where I believe we're going to break the world record for a continuous drone flight. The drone that we have today, if the if we could hitch on the military system, uh, which we can't, we have to wait for the public system to go online. We could fly from uh, Orlando, Florida to Juneau, Alaska and back without ever refueling and without polluting the planet. As a matter of fact, the exhaust from the drone is cleaner than the ambient air. And that was something that, uh, you know, we proved in tests. The mission statement of the drone is that we, we have a working relationship with the Red Cross who we've been working with since 2005. We want to use this technology for search and rescue. So you get a hurricane or tornado that hits an area, you could put this drone up in the air and have it fly for days and fly in grid patterns back and forth and look for survivors uh, with infrared cameras and, and other cameras people that are lost at sea. You could, again, take this flying grid patterns and, and look for people. This is definitely not a toy. Uh, the first version of this has a 15-foot wingspan, and we're even thinking bigger. But the drone can carry up to 280 pounds of medical supplies. So when we've spoken with the Red Cross, you know, imagine you have a uh, hurricane that hits Haiti, and you want to get people medical supplies very quickly. You could launch from Orlando, be in Haiti uh, within, you know, a couple hours and drop uh, medical supplies exactly where it's needed. The drone has VTOL and a non-VTOL mode. So you can either land on pretty much, you know, any field, uh, short takeoff and landing, or you can use the VTOL capabilities to land on a beach, let's say. David, I'm just curious as you're, you know, you're talking about the different technologies and you, you know, you shared uh, your initial work in the, in the 1990s with the military, but I'm just curious, you as a human being, you as a person, where is this innovation coming from? Where's your, where's your motivation, your drive? Uh, what, what has in your life made you who you are? Uh, I had a Christian upbringing. And from a very young age, I was uh, in a prayer group. You know, as I studied the Bible, uh, I wanted to either, I saw what Jesus was doing and I thought, well, that's pretty cool. And, uh, you know, the idea of healing people and feeding people is pretty appealing. And uh, I didn't want to be a farmer. Uh, so I thought, well, you know, maybe I can do something with trying to heal people. 
So that was kind of the initial impetus, but I've, I've always had an interest in creating things and inventing things. But uh, as time has gone on and, you know, you mature and you learn different things, what I believe today is that when you pray, you can access a higher state of consciousness. You can access, you know, some people might call it the Akashic field or accessing the divine, but very much now today, I believe that anything that I've been a part of developing, the information is, has not come from me directly. It's all come through downloads, through prayer. And so I'd want to give God the credit for that. So ultimately, these technologies have to be used for the greater good. They have to be used to advance mankind. So we're healing people with light. We're healing people with energy. We're creating non-polluting energy production technology that can be used to save lives. So the direction I very much want to go in uh, with this, with this company, is to make a difference in the world so we can create technology that's not harmful to the planet, create sustainability, and uh, provide healing as well as other things. Yeah, thank you. I, I've been you know, listening to you uh, throughout the program, and I just kept coming back to what what drives you, what motivates you, where did, where did that originate from, and what keeps you going? So thank yeah, you. Yeah, you know, I have kids, and uh, I'm really scared for my kids about the, where we are in the world today. We We can't leave our children with the planet in the condition that it's in. Uh, mankind... I'll say it that way because I think men are mostly responsible. I'd, I'd let women off the hook on this. Men are pretty bad. Uh, mankind has done a horrific job at polluting the planet and polluting human beings. You know, if you took blood samples, you look at uh, any number of studies that have been done on this, you could take a sample of several hundred people, 100% have foreign chemicals in their body, and the average number is 97 or 98 foreign chemicals. So th this is outrageous and, uh, you know, can't be tolerated any longer. So I very much believe that we can use technology to clean the planet, clean up our bodies, get people healthy naturally, and then create technology so we can have a sustainable future. That means, you know, different things to different people. Uh, so... The technology, I don't think, is so much the issue. It's more the politics involved of getting these things to market. So, you know, with with yesterday and today, we both we, we we've talked about this question of technology for the good or technology, you know, uh, in the destructive, polluting sense that brings us to this point in time. And I personally keep coming back to the thing you've just talked about. David, and that's one, uh, where does creativity come from? How do we uh, translate that? We're almost, uh, in my opinion, it's like we're transponders. We, uh, the energy comes in, and then the question is, what's the consciousness of the being that then uh, brings that information, that download uh, out into the world? And so it seems that this question of consciousness, especially if we're going to have that kind of quality, positive impact on the planet for your children and the children of, of all of humanity, are we going to allow future generations to survive and to prosper uh, in our world? That it is always this question of consciousness and focus. What is the intent of the creator? Tom, weigh in on that from your standpoint. You've worked with creative people all of your life as well. What, where are you on that? Yeah, I, I think um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm challenged in that you know, oftentimes creativity is happening within the the structure of an organization, where there are rules and guidelines and you know, um, a requirement that the, the the creativity be channeled into a new product innovation, into a new product. Um, if I contrast that with artists I've worked with uh, throughout my life, whether it's in film or fine art or sculpture or elsewhere, 
it's you know it's it's tapping into the the, the universe, which is at least my interpretation uh, is about beauty. Uh, you know the the energy of of the universe is the energy of love, and so that combination of beauty and love is what what is the source of of that creativity. But it it does get manipulated and uh, misused in the uh, in the in the drive for making money and commerce. And I, I think that's where you know technology oftentimes becomes uh, misused, or you know the the folks involved in it misunderstand or don't fully understand the ecosystem they're operating in, and the the technology that gets created uh, falls short of of what's needed and what's possible. Yeah, you know, I think there could be a happy medium, but it's up to the owners, the CEOs, board of directors of these companies to your point, have the intention that they want to use their revenues to develop tech that can help people and not necessarily for financial motives. I would completely agree with that. With LifeWave, we have three different components. We have our products, we have our business opportunity, and we have our humanitarian efforts. So when we started with this, the idea was, okay, when you're a company that's successful, you should give back and help those in need that are less fortunate. So we've donated money to the Red Cross, we've donated money to UNICEF and organizations like this to help with relief efforts, provide medical aid. But a, a point came where I thought maybe we could work with these organizations in a different way. Maybe we could create technology and new tools that they could use to uh, make their efforts more effective. And as a result, uh, use this technology as a symbol of what's possible. So the drone initiative is nonprofit. The idea behind this is we would take money that we've earned, put it into the program, and use it to facilitate relief efforts globally for people in need. But it, it's not just a normal drone. What powers the drone is something that actually cleans the air as it flies. And the engine itself is extremely efficient and very, very clean and healthy for the environment. So uh, myself and my team, we've spent a lot of time thinking about what would this look like, how to create it, what should it do? And to see it work uh, and work in real life after several years of development has been incredibly rewarding. David, the, the, the technology that has created the, the, the drone and its engine, is it applicable in other industries other than, uh, in other words, can it be used in, in other ways other than on the drone? If the political will is there, then yes. So we could easily take the technology and create clean burning. I'll refer to it that way, although that's a little bit misleading. Uh, but we could create clean power plants that someone could use this to power their home. You could have uh, distributed generation. So if you wanted to have this technology used to power an entire community, you could do that as well. Uh, could power automobiles, could power boats. Um, the base of the technology is, is not really very limited. You know, uh, a, a number of beliefs that I hold is that energy is basically neutral, that it's a question of whether or not how it's used. I know in human beings, uh, I believe that we either use the energy that flows through it or that energy causes a lot of difficulties in us as instruments, you know, sure. which is where a lot of the addictions and, and traumas and other things come from, at least in my belief system. So, um, Kim, you want to come back in? Let's pick up this conversation on consciousness, on mechanics, uh, on uh, whether technology can, in fact, uh, produce good in the world or whether it's always going to be that kind of struggle as uh, the Greeks believe. Well, first, uh, David, 
hats off to you, brother. You're doing some incredible <laughs> <Thank> you, <Jim. laughs> stuff. I'm um, just sitting here. I was on your website and and just looking at all your products and and the uh, ways that you figured out uh, very creatively to help people stay healthy, which, as you're pointing out, in a world of endocrine disrupting chemicals where we've got you know a hundred foreign chemicals in our body, we all need to focus on the fact that that we need to enhance our capacity just to stay you know normal <laughs> yeah. and you're doing that in a very powerful way one quick technical question i note that you can only buy your products if you're a brand partner so it's not your website isn't open to ordinary people that would just want to buy the uh, uh patches or anything like that you've got to be a some kind of a partner Oh, no, I, actually, uh, we have a, a customer and then a preferred customer program. So if someone just wanted to purchase uh, the patches and use them for personal use without becoming a brand partner, they could do that. And then to the the larger question that, that George is, is, is making, I would say that one of the exciting things, and I think you represent it, that I didn't kind of get to, but I think is worth really stating, that given the, the the deep problem of technology, I would say, as as it's emerged, biomimicry is the only way through the thicket. Human beings have to stop using technology to trick nature, to somehow neutralize it uh, and dominate it, to just as you've done. How do you, you use nature in a biomimicry way where you're mirroring nature. So to the degree to which we can enter into that sanctum sanctorum. And and uh, and I want to just stress this and get your comment because you're a man of faith. What the Greeks believed was that what we experience is the outer manifestation of nature, but the inner realm of nature is where divinity is. And if you can, if you can enter into that divinity, you're told how to use nature for service of the divine. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's why the Greeks had a Promethean notion, which is conquering and dominating nature and what they call an Orphic uh, dimension. And feels to me that you're very much in the tradition of Orpheus. You know, you're using nature and using this with in this for the sake of the divine, which means for the sake of healing and compassion. And I just want to note that and just acknowledge uh, that as a man of faith, you're using technology in a way that's fundamentally of service to di to divinity. And well, um, I don't know whether you have any comment on that, because I, but I think there's a deep connection between what you do and what you believe. Yeah, well, thank you, you know, and I, I believe that your premise is absolutely correct because human beings have a history of wanting to dominate others. You know, we have endless wars for centuries, dominate, attempt to dominate nature, which is kind of silly when you think about it as a presence because we're, we're trying to destroy the world that we live in that provides for every need. So it's, it's, it, not very smart thing to do to destroy uh, where you live. So the you know how do we go about and create technology that's in service to humanity in harmony with the planet and nature? We can look at previous researchers like Victor Schauberger, who was uh, lived in Austria in the early 1900s to the mid 1900s, and he was known as the water wizard. And uh, he had a number of patents, so at least there's a historical record of his work. But very much he was in favor of uh, when we look at uh, log flumes, the way that log flumes were being built back then were distorting the flow of energy through the water. And so what he would simply do was install devices made of wood that would keep the water uh, flowing in a natural way it caused the water to spiral and that way the logs could move uh, smoothly down the river in harmony with nature. And Schauberger had an, a number of technologies like this. So when we look at 
how are we going to solve the energy crisis, it's really not almost the correct question that's being asked. What really should be asked is how do we harness the energy that's already available? You know, on one level, we could say, well, you know, you look at solar and that's one form of it, but there's actually enough electricity in the environment on the planet to meet 100% of human needs many, many, many times over, 25, 30, 50 times over what we actually require. And uh, if over time there is a decrease in the population, then, uh, which I hope, uh, then we're going to be able to continue to uh, meet those energy needs without having to resort to nuclear or coal or, or anything else. So some of the technology that we've worked on developing, which has been successful, has been doing exactly that, tapping into the energy reserves that are already here and doing, it's not solar, it's completely other approach entirely. Um, one other thing to note, and uh, George, this goes to a comment that you made actually, is uh, human beings are more amazing than what most people uh, give credit for. So in the DNA itself, when we look at cell division, the DNA uh, unzips itself so that it can, it can replicate. And the way it does that is that there are hydrogen bonds holding the DNA together. And these hydrogen bonds uh, spiral counterclockwise to one another. So we did a very interesting experiment here where we created a plasma, a hydrogen plasma, and caused the hydrogen plasma to counter rotate. And something very interesting happens. Hydrogen appears out of the vacuum spontaneously. And uh, it was Fritz Pop that found that there were these highly coherent emission of light coming from the cell and coming from the DNA, coming from all living things. So what we found, uh, and this was validated by other research, is that hydrogen is all around us. And if we have technology, we can actually cultivate that uh, in a sustainable way. And of course, you burn hydrogen or you put it through a fuel cell and uh, you're just gonna make water. So uh, these are the type of things that we investigate. Yeah, you know, you, one measure of consciousness as applied to technology is just to see how much damage or not the technology deployed actually does. When you think of the damage of nuclear power, you think of the damage to coal, to the environment, to health, uh, that's your first clue, uh, whether you're being Promethean or Orphic. Uh, in your consciousness as you're applying that technology. So the differentiation you're making, David, I think is really, really insightful. And uh, I, I'm so delighted, George and Tom, you brought David on because it's inspiring me uh, very deeply. Uh, and uh, uh, particularly for, a, a, you know, a, a man of faith to be able to, to do all this because of belief in a, in a, in a divinity uh, is a, is a, is a, is an amazing thing. It's rare in this world. <laughs> I wish it wasn't. Uh, you know, we we could really live in uh, a utopian society yeah. instead of dystopian, which looks like we might be headed towards. So it's it's up to us uh, collectively to bring these technologies into the public so they can be utilized and. Uh, you know, show the global communities that there are better ways to do things. We don't have to pollute. We can live in a clean environment. We can generate electricity and energy sustainably. Our cars don't have to pollute. All of these things are attainable, uh, but it, it's greed and politics that uh, have really stood in the way.